It's interesting to see how a concept can change or be repurposed with the passage of time. To me, the mobile market is one such example of this. At first, it was a new frontier for gaming, a new and exciting platform for new concepts and spin-offs like Epic Games' own Infinity Blade. Now, it's just a cesspool of grind-heavy games and traps that desperately rely on microtransactions just so the player can see a modicum of progress. But this change in the mobile market also brought with it the proliferation of another concept that still maintains a great deal of potential and promise for the future, free-to-play. So to cap off 2018, I decided to take a look at some free-to-play titles and to also see if there's anything worth the time, effort, and maybe some money from this part of gaming, specifically from the PC and console platforms. So to kick off this showcase, I'm going to be taking a look at an MMO that I've had interest in since it was first announced. Star Wars The Old Republic. <laughs> Developed by Bioware and published by EA for PC, I was first drawn to the Old Republic for the same reason as many others. Knights of the Old Republic, which I played the hell out of back in high school. So news of a new game, MMO or not, that was going to be Kodor 3 was more than enough to get me revved up for it like a horse being let out to stud. However, anyone who's been following me for a while will know my history of limited internet access and lack of a decent gaming PC. So I wasn't able to give this game a go till two or three years ago, at least. And my first impression of the Old Republic was like eating a fistful of saltpeter. I created my first character, a Sith assassin named Aldordan, and set foot upon the ancient Sith homeworld of Korriban, and immediately I was swept up with nostalgic memories of setting through the Valley of the Dark Lords in KOTOR 2. And almost as fast as those happy memories came, they were immediately dashed across the plasticine rocks of the Old Republic. As soon as I was able to explore the starting area and get a good look around, I knew this wasn't the successor I was expecting. I won't say the visuals for both KOTOR games have held up well after all these years, but I I found them to be far more stimulating to look at than this. The striking colours and flat textures make the environments look more like toy sets than actual landscapes, and when combined with the reality that the zones are static rather than reactive, it makes everything feel inanimate, as if it was never alive to begin with. At least this doesn't apply to the characters, but due to the visuals and animations which look like they were touched up animations from the original games, characters look more like they're from Toy Story rather than in addition to an epic space opera. I refuse to live a, a lesser life. Finish me. I will not accept mercy. But of course, this is a free-to-play title, so what about monetization? Well, as you know, EA has a bit of a reputation for aggressive and anti-consumer practices in their games, and it's still the case here. This doesn't mean you need to cough up cash just in order to progress, they at least showed some restraint here, unlike with the new Battlefront. But they do go out of their way to inconvenience free players into either spending cash or into getting a subscription. One full character progression past a certain level? One access to full cosmetic customization? Want more convenient fast travel? One access to your storage, which the game says you'll get once you also get your ship? Screw you and pay us for these privileges. Beyond this bullshittery to push you into subscription, monetization is based primarily around buying things like cosmetics and mounts. But the inconvenience put on the free players are far more likely to annoy to the point of quitting than subscribing. Now anyone who watched my MMO showcase will know my opinion on tab targeting combat. I think it's shit, and unfortunately Bioware chose to use it for the Old Republic. Tab targeting and other combat systems that rely on auto-attacking or universal cooldowns, to me, create a disconnect between the player and the action, making it feel like my influence over fights is minimal at best and non-existent at worst. But to give the Old Republic some credit in this area, enemies in later zones are actually quite challenging and do demand that the player think in the heat of the moment. And character progression is quite robust, so you can personalize your character's class into something that is more specialized for certain encounters. Now believe it or not, the Old Republic is packed with content to see and do other than exploring its zones in PvE or PvP. One of the other things you can do is space combat, which could be considered amazing, 
if it was still 1998. Space missions are just a ripoff of Star Fox with your ship on rails and enemies flying back to attack. Except here, it's worse. Because there's just too much stuff that has the same colour palette so everything blends together into visual clutter. So it's easy to lose track of where enemies are and just end up failing the missions all because you were unable to keep track of something. There's also dedicated PvP in the form of War Zones where Republic and Imperial players can duke it out head to head, but I wasn't able to give it a go. When I tried, I ended up waiting in a queue for almost an entire hour and gave up on trying it out. Closest I got to checking it out was when some other player challenged me to a duel on Korriban, and what I saw wasn't particularly fun. I'm sure the real PvP experience has more meat to it over the space combat, but considering my distaste for the game's combat, I don't think it's something I could critique without some negative bias if I was able to give it a go. Now, I know it sounds like I'm just bashing on this game for most of this video, but that's because I've saved its one absolute strength for last. The story. I'm not joking, as much of a shadow of its former self Bioware is looking like each day, The Old Republic still shows the studio has talent as storytellers. The Sith Inquisitor story had my character prove himself worthy to be an apprentice, serve and surpass his master, gain great power to defeat a rival, and at the end take his rightful place as a member of the Dark Council. The one authority in the Empire second only to the Sith Emperor himself. And that's only one story. The base game has seven other the stories to experience, and if nothing else, gives the base experience a great deal of value for free. Plus, if I ever spend any money on this game, it'll be for the expansions. Not only so I can see the stories they have in store, but also so I can continue Alderdan's own story as a Dark Lord of the Sith. As far as my experience with MMOs go, The Old Republic isn't one of my better ones, but I still found myself coming back to it for one thing, its story and story alone. But while that may have been enough to keep me playing, I can see other people who aren't that interested in narrative abandoning it, something that will not be helped by EA's monetization and boring combat. It may not be the Kodor 3 we all wanted, but glimpses of such greatness managed to shine through time after time. Now this game is balls of fun and has just gotten so much better since the closed beta. Quake Champions, this is a pleasing mix of modern hero shooters mixed with old school multiplayer gameplay. Brought to us exclusively for PC by Bethesda and id Software, but also Saber Interactive of Time Shift fame. Now I know you're thinking, is it really that good? Are there problems from combining the two styles of game? Well sit back, pour yourself a beer, and let me show you how it is. <laughs> For those who don't know, Quake Champions is more of a return to the style of Quake 3 Arena than what we got with Wolfenstein, and while that is a disappointment, the game does make up for it. At its core, Champions is an arena shooter right out of the 90s. Maps allow for a good deal of player maneuverability alongside verticality, scattered throughout them are ammo and health pickups, and of course, you can see your gunshots fly through the air towards their targets. Playing this brought back pleasant high school memories of going to LAN parties with my friends and playing Unreal tournament well into the night. Similar to Arena, the player is free to choose their avatar, but in Champions, this does have a bearing on gameplay. Different characters are not only visually distinctive, but have differences in health, armor, and speed, leading themselves to different playstyles that work as an advantage in certain parts of the in-game maps, or as weaknesses in other parts. And of course, each character does have a unique super move that works shockingly well, and can be applied to different situations for different tactical benefits. With the exception of Ranger, the majority of the roster was composed of original characters, but over time, it started to become Bethesda's answer to Smash Brothers, with the inclusion of characters like the Doom Slayer from Doom, a Strog from Quake 4, a Death Knight from the original Quake, and most recently, an Unseen Soldier from Quake 2 or 4. I hope to almighty Cthulhu that not only more characters get added to the roster, but we start to see more characters from Bethesda games. Not only because it would be amazing to see the Keeper from the Evil Within go up against the Lone Wanderer from Fallout 3, but because this game shows that arena shooters and hero shooters 
games are tailor made for each other and I want to see the roster match Overwatch's. Incoming quad. To go along with the core shooter experience, Quake Champions offers robust character customization options with tons of decisions for how a character can look. Each character has around three or four different skin sets and you can mix and match different heads, torsos and leg options and those themselves come with their own auxiliary options. To go along with this, there's also tons of shaders and weapon skins that further drive home the smash comparison. For instance, I unlocked the skins for the rocket launcher from Quake and super shotgun from Doom. So every time I'm in a match, not only am I using these classic weapons, but they're even held in the same way from the original games, which I can safely say brought a huge smile to my face. There are two ways to unlock these. One is by completing challenges, and the other is loot boxes, which are of course, purchasable. Now, do not fret, while this game does feature the most dreaded of microtransactions, they are handled fairly. For instance, while you can buy the different tiers with three different currencies, you can also earn them by just playing the game. Every time you rank up, you earn a second tier box, just like in Overwatch, or you can take cosmetics you don't want anymore and sell them off for one of the three currencies. The currency you buy with real money can be used to purchase not only the highest grade boxes, but also individual champions, XP boosters, and items that are available in a rotating stock. And on top of that, one currency you earn just by playing the game can be used to buy champions as well. There's even an option just to pay a flat fee for accessing all current and future champions as well. But if I'm remembering correctly, it used to cost around $30 to $40, which was a reasonable price, but now it costs around $60 and considering it's literally a season pass for a game that's still in early access, it's a deal you can safely call a ripoff. I'm sure you've noticed by now that I've spent most of this review giving Quake Champions a lavish tongue bath, whereas I gave the Old Republic a most fierce tongue lashing. Well, like the prior review, that's because, in this case, I've saved the one major flaw for last wait times. Back when this was still in beta and even earlier in its early access release, the game was packed with people looking to play and you could find a match in no time. Now it's common to spend 10 minutes waiting for a match and when you've waited that long, you'd be forgiven for just closing the game. I don't understand why this is the case though. I checked Steam Spy and Quake Champions constantly goes back and forth between 1000 to 2000 players each day, yet when I tried to play the arcade playlist I couldn't find a single match, which is a shame when the modes in it look like absolute balls of fun. There there is a community out there that is playing this, but for some reason I just couldn't find it. I can't pin down what the core of the issue is, maybe it's the servers, maybe it's the internet on my end, maybe it was Steam Spy showing the wrong number for the player count, either way it's something that Bethesda and id need to tackle before the game leaves early access. In its current state, Quake Champions already feels like it's complete and can only get better with more updates as time goes on. It straddles a fine line between old school and new school that actually leaves fans of both types of games satisfied. All of its strengths from the gameplay and handling of monetization are only brought down by the connection issues, which if not addressed in time could take a great game and kill it before it has a chance to show its ultimate potential. I hope you guys enjoy this video, now on to the next game, Warframe. This is one of those games you often hear people constantly talk about in high esteem for one reason or another, usually about how great the gameplay is or how consumer friendly monetization is. But anyone who knew me in high school will let you know that I was never one to partake in what was popular just because it was popular for one reason or another. But with this showcase, now seems like a good time to really jump in and see why everyone speaks so highly of Warframe. And after spending a good deal of time with it, I can safely make the following statement. Everything you heard about Warframe being great, is true. Warframe is set in a far future where multiple factions and offshoots of humanity fight over what's left of humanity's highest empire. And the only thing keeping the solar system from tearing itself apart is a group of super-powered space ninjas, the Tenno. Now, narrative isn't the game's focus, but it is there for those who go looking for it in terms of story and lore. Story is primarily for tutorial context at the start and a reward for reaching certain milestones. The problem with this setup is that once the tutorial is done, you're left with no real direction, grinding missions until you 
you meet the requirements to unlock a new quest line, which are self-contained and don't feel like the universe has been impacted by completing them, especially when you're running around an open world zone and suddenly get taunted by a character you've never met before, only to then unlock a quest where it's confirmed this is the first canonical time they're interacting with you. Regardless of this, stories in the quests are solidly written and are enough to shake up the gameplay loop that they always feel like a reward when you play them. Now the game uses a hub based mission structure where from a star map you're free to choose what missions you want to tackle in what order. Progress through them is linear at first, but once you get off earth progress becomes increasingly non-linear and you're free to redo missions as much as you want, either for the sake of grinding or to ruin the day of an enemy that gave you a bad time earlier. And of course you can tackle just about every mission in solo or co-op. There's a healthy variety of missions to do from standard horde modes to stealth focused missions to VIP capture and even space combat missions that feature space combat that the Old Republic wishes it had. On top of that, the last two major updates, Planes of Adalon and Fortuna, added open-ended zones that can be explored like the open worlds in games like Red Dead Redemption and Skyrim. The only issue is that the missions are broken into planet-based zones where they share map palettes and even reuse the same maps. A lot of challenge in a mission can be lost once you know the layout of a map you've played through around 50 times in other missions. In spite of what was most likely a cost-cutting measure, there is plenty to see traverse the solar system. But that's just the missions, the real meat and potatoes of Warframe are its combat and grinding. Yes, Warframe is a grind heavy game, but it's like MGS5 in that the gameplay is fun and everything feeds into something else that you just don't mind in the end. Combat is a mix of third person shooting, melee combat and parkour platforming, all revolving around a breakneck pace. Regardless of what type of build or weapons you use, you always feel like a literal space ninja god of death, dealing destruction to those in your way, all the while collecting money and materials to build new weapons and classes to try out. The only issue I have with the combat is that thanks to its fast pace, it can feel loose at times. It can be easy to accidentally over or under aim and miss a target, but thankfully it doesn't stop it from being fun at all times, though I can see not everyone enjoying the grinding. But the game is very transparent of how to unlock weapons weapons, classes, or warframes as they're called, and quests so you're always free to choose a goal you want to work towards and onwards. Now I'm sure the one thing you've heard more than anything about Warframe is how fairly monetized it is and how it doesn't nickel and dime. Well, sit down and buckle your seatbelts because everything you've heard is true. Just about every item can be gained either by crafting or buying it. Don't have the premium currency, platinum, then use the regular currency to buy a blueprint and now uh, you have a goal to work towards. This can be done with both warframes and weapons and since new items are all set to level 1, need to be buffed up by playing. You're never given an advantage over other players if you paid for them. Some items don't have blueprints available so you need to buy platinum to get them. Then there's the prime access vault, where you can pay real money for the most stylish and elite cosmetics. What's on offer is always in rotation with systems in place to get what's not available up Front. During my time with it, at no point did I feel like the game was trying to push me towards buying anything, and whenever I gazed at something with covetous longing, I knew I had options towards getting it, though I did find the grinding option for new warframes to be a little excessive. You basically need to grind for crafting materials to make different parts that need their own blueprints as well, while also dealing with a crafting wait time which can be anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. That one gripe aside, warframes monetization is hands down the best I've seen so far, and has the honor of being the first free to play game I've splashed money on in almost a year. I'm sure you've noticed by now, Warframe is a good looking game and your eyes aren't deceiving you. The game not only looks good, but runs well too. But I'm sure you've also noticed how unique the game's art direction is as well. And while you have to give kudos to the game for originality, I do have one issue with its looks. It's butt ugly. This is more of a personal nitpick than anything major, but I've hated Warframe's art direction ever since I first saw it. I'm not a fan of how the artists interpreted biomechanics into the aesthetic of the Tenno, and frankly, the other groups don't fare much better to me. With the Grenier looking like walking turds, the Corpus looking like box heads and mascara addicts, and the Infested looking like the bastard love children of the thing in the blob. 
Some designs, I won't deny, are better than others, and thanks to my time with it, I don't hate it as much as I used to, but I still believe that Digital Extremes artists could have come up with something much better if given more time. Additional life support has arrived. Comparing Warframe to most other free-to-play games is a disservice to it because, frankly, Warframe earns comparison to any top dollar AAA game. When compared to something like Black Ops 4, it absolutely trumps that yearly expansion, not only in terms of quality, but content as well. How many games can you honestly say can boast up to $1,000 worth of friggin' content from the word go? Warframe is not only one of the best free-to-play games I've ever ever played, but one of the best. And with Digital Extreme's commitment to pumping out new content, it can only get even better with the passage of time. And with its recent port to the Switch, it's now available on practically every major platform. So now you've got no reason not to pick it up and answer the Lotus's call. And here's hoping the last game for this year's showcase is close to as good as Warframe. I'm talking about Iron Sight. Investors! <laughs> Enjoy this display of security prowess. Rest assured, your investment is protected. Now this was quite the surprise. I know I don't sound like it, but back in the day I was into Call of Duty. Sure I was late to the party, but I still cried when Ghost died in Modern Warfare 2, I was with Mason when he was asked about the numbers, and I was there when Modern Warfare 3 went for a cheap emotional pull with a kid dying. But like so many others, I grew bored with playing the same style of shooter year after year, and ended up using the Doom 3 BFG edition to cleanse my palate. Since then, the last COD game I played was Infinite Warfare, and that really just left us all flat from disappointment. But then a dear friend of mine told me about this and how it compared to COD, and everything he said about Ironsight, area and Whipple Games title was true. It's a great COD replacement. Now there is a story to Ironsight, involving economic instability pitting the US and Russia against one another, but Ironsight's focus is squarely on a pure multiplayer experience. So whatever is said in the opening cinematic can be ignored. The only time story or even single player comes into play is during tutorial missions, or when you first start the game up and watch the intro cinematic. Right off the bat, Ironside features multiple playlists that feature quite the diverse offering of game modes, from your standard team deathmatch, to bomb defusal and planting, and some fresh takes on point control. The gameplay itself feels like it's been ripped straight out of Call of Duty. Nine times out of ten in a shootout, whoever shoots first will live, and the maps are tight, compact arenas, funneling players into direct confrontations. But Ironside makes one change to what Black Ops 2 did with its then new score streak system that makes it stand out more. Countdowns. Rather than getting access access to your loadout goodies through repeated scoring, they're all on a countdown, and every time you earn points for kills or going after objectives, the points are counted towards reducing each countdown, making it easier yet still so rewarding when you unlock access to a guided drone missile. And these countdowns are balanced, so while it is possible to unlock your first two bonuses just by waiting, your best bonus can only be unlocked by playing the game rewarding skill and giving the best players a well-deserved edge per match. Point. Visually, the game is well presented with an art direction that was liberally inspired by Modern Warfare and Black Ops 2 with some East Asian eye candy mixed in. I won't deny it may be impractical for the female soldiers to be basically supermodels, but I can't really complain about it, and more than anything, I like that Whipple decided to revel in military fantasy rather than sanitize their artists. Either that, or they know that sexy babes sell games. The overall graphical fidelity is solid, with the only visual drawback being some blocky and flap map geometry, which is more than likely just a product of a limited budget than a lack of talent or skill from the developers. Ooh. 
Monetization is the only aspect of the game that raises my eyebrows because it's based exclusively around loot boxes, which can be acquired through three different types of currency or by the usual ranking up by playing the game. Now, considering how most online only games are moving away from loot boxes, thanks to the developers realizing that people are just sick of them, it is disappointing that Ironside is sticking with them. Something that can be only assumed as a result of the devs being based in the East Asia market. I can see the inclusion of a Fortnite style battle pass and a rotating stock working just as well in Ironside and doing well considering that the game is fun to play. But for what it's worth right now, the pricing on the boxes is fair from what I've seen and they contain cosmetic options, add-ons and weapons. But since the game is still in its open beta, it is safe to expect the monetization scheme to change and hopefully become something less archaic, but it also has the possibility of becoming much worse. In its current state, Ironside is already a fun game that managed to take me back to a time when Call of Duty was undeniably good, yet still manages to do enough to stand as its own product. Its method of acquiring money from its player base may be odorous, but at least it doesn't impact of the experience or do something as egregious as charging for a red dot site. If you've been looking for a new shooter to play on PC, then this is something that's worth keeping an eye on. Especially if it's already this good in just beta form, then it has so much potential to reach as more updates are rolled out. Alright, it's awesome to finally get this done. Sorry it took so long, I've been stuck working flat out, but hey, better late than never. Hope you guys had a great New Year's Eve, and for the first game review of 2019, I'm actually going to take a look at something I bought on Steam during Boxing Day. Dusk. That thing just has me hooked, so stuff it, I'm going to review it. And for movie reviews, I don't have an immediate date for when I'm going to get the Home Alone 2 review out, but I will be getting my video on the top 5 and bottom 5 movies of 2018 out as soon as possible, and I'm planning to do a review on Incredibles 2. I've got all that and more coming up, so like usual, stick around.